Just a note to let you know that we are now live streaming on YouTube. Good morning. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Good morning, Anita. How are you? I'm good. Oh, Anita. Hello. Anita. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Oh my God, my hero. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> so this is going to be great. I have a feeling this could be something that we could talk about for four, five, six hours. <laughs> or days. <laughs> yeah. Morning, people. Hey, Hi, Rudy. How are hey, you? Hey. Great, great. And by the way, Anita, I heard you say my hero. Well, uh, Suko, you're one of my heroes too. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Morning. Morning. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm Welcome. good. How are you? Thanks. Happy to be here. Excited that you are. I love your background, Rudy. Is that actual work or is it, a, is it something yeah. that this behind? It's, it's a series of um, actually demos that I do for class. So wow. traditional stuff, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and are they actual paintings? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, because I know you can, there's a way that you can cut and paste a background. Right, there, there are several paintings just put together. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, they're wonderful. The great background. Thank, thank you, Stephanie, thank you. So last night was really great. Steve Heller is the man. <laughs> For sure. He knows yes, more about was... art, illustration, design than everyone I know put together, pretty much. <laughs> no question about it. Yes, he is absolutely incredible. Good morning, Robin. Hi there, everyone. This is Rich at the Norman Rockwell Museum, just giving you an update. Um, we still are kind of, people are still wandering in, so I might give it a couple minutes before we start, just to be safe. Um, we're at 50, but we have about 100 more that have registered, so we just want to make sure that they have time to get in. Um, if you are not going to be speaking, uh, if I may ask you to mute, and also, if you know how to stop your video, that way we can just focus on who's going to be speaking. Um, but if you don't know how to do it, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it for you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll talk soon. When, when the, I stop sharing my screen, that'll be Stephanie's cue to start. Thank you. Hello, Faye. <laughs> Good morning, Faye. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I am Chief Curator Stephanie Plunkett, and I am really happy to have you with us uh, to hear this wonderful day of talented speakers uh, this morning. And um, thanks to many of you who were here uh, with us last evening for a great program. And if you're just joining us, we're glad you're here. Our sessions today will explore notions of freedom of speech and artistic expression from a variety of viewpoints. For designers, cartoonists, and illustrators, many questions arise when creating art that takes up socially significant and sometimes controversial themes. Some choose the DIY route, working independently with a free hand without access to the large scale distribution that comes with a recognized masthead. Others work with leading news organizations and magazines, agreeing to collaborate in exchange for access to audiences. Popular art has always involved such choices, but what are the trade-offs and what are the rewards? Our discussion today will begin with commentary by D.B. Dowd, the co-presenter of this symposium, and by Kevin Moran, executive editor of the esteemed regional newspaper, The Berkshire Eagle. Two panels will follow, DIY print culture and citizenship from about 10.30 to 11.30, and resistance and mainstream publishing, media delivery and propaganda from about 11.45 to 12.45. And we will close with some discussion uh, with all of our panelists today. Many thanks to the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation for their generous support of this program and to the Berkshire Eagle, our most appreciated media sponsor. I wanna thank also my colleagues, Rich Bradway, Mary Burley and Alyssa Stubel who will be working behind the scenes in support of this event. And most importantly, we thank you all for making time to be here. Uh, so please do share any thoughts or questions that you may have in the chat and we will definitely bring uh, as many as possible forward during our conversations. So with that, it's a great pleasure to introduce D.B. Dowd. Douglas is an illustrator, designer, and professor of art and American culture studies at Washington University in St. Louis. He's faculty director of the D.B. Dowd Modern Graphic History Library in the Division of Special Collections in Washington University Libraries and has held the Society of Fel has led the Society of Fellows at the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies here at the Norman Rockwell Museum. That program uh, has through the years been designed to inspire rigorous academic consideration of published imagery. The author and illustrator of Spartan Holidays, an award-winning journal, Douglas has written and spoken extensively on published imagery and comics. His book, Stick Figures, Drawing as Human Practice, was published in collaboration with the Rockwell Center in 2018, and we're very proud of that. And A is for Autocrat is his most recent publication. Douglas, thank you so much for starting off our day, and welcome. Good morning. So, uh, pleased to be here. I'm going to pull up something to share with you all. Okay. Um, so my, my job this morning is to maybe pull together a few framing thoughts and possibly to build a bridge from uh, the great Stephen Heller who spoke to us last night in the keynote and uh, to get us ready to hear from our, uh, our panelists today who are an impressive bunch. And I'm, I'm very excited to, to be part of that. Uh, and also to hand off to, to Kevin Moran. So uh, let me just get to it. Um, as Stephanie said, I'm uh, uh, proudly associated with Washington University Libraries, where I teach uh, in St. Louis. And uh, I'm also very happy to say that I'm uh, uh, one of the folks involved in 
the MFA in Illustration and Visual Culture at WashU, which is a collaboration between the Sam Fox School and the library. So we, we heard about propaganda last night. And, uh, you know, propaganda is a subject that seemed kind of dusty and uh, done with until relatively recently. And it's become more pressing. Uh, and and uh, that's part of what brings us together today. So I just want to sort of tease apart a little bit some of the uh, questions at the heart of propaganda. It's a term that it covers a lot and it um, is often used in a, as if to categorize a kind of distrustful speech, right? That, that there's, a, there's, an, a, there's an agenda which is uh, suspect. And it's actually, um, depending upon who's doing it and uh, what their aims are, um, it, it can be relatively value neutral. It's, it's, uh, there are a lot of variables here. Certainly advertising and the history of advertising is the birthplace of modern propaganda. And the very smart folks who were trying to come up with ways to get people to buy things and want things that they didn't know that they wanted and still do that uh, is a big part of what became propaganda. Um, and as uh, Steve mentioned last night, the, the government got involved in World War I. George Creel's uh, involvement in the uh, Committee for Public uh, Information, he recruited Charles Dana Gibson uh, to lead, was basically the poster shop. And this is an example of a, of a poster by J.C. Leindecker that uh, I would call relatively unpersuasive. Um, kind of, it looks kind of silly now. Um, but Leindecker was actually a very effective uh, visual communicator in the service of ideas uh, that were perhaps, this is quite explicitly ideological. Uh, in other cases, he covers more ground. But the United States, as an ideological contraption and as a vehicle for propagandistic communication, is, is a complicated affair, relatively well captured here by these two images. The contradictions in American history are profound, which is part of what we have been bumping up against uh, in the last several years. So big posters uh, on walls are one thing. We're living in a time that's a rather different technological regime. The, the, we're looking at a newspaper feature covering a different communication system covering the events at the Capitol. And these the technology of phones and live streaming has created uh, a, what feels like a shockingly new challenge. But I think there are ways in which that it's less new than we think, as is often the case. Um, the the social, social media, could, you could argue, was invented in the 1520s, uh, specifically in the service of the Protestant Reformation. And the pamphlet was, in fact, the vehicle that drove uh, quite a bit of charged communication, specifically um, uh, a pamphlet written by Luther, illustrated by uh, Lucas Cranach, the, uh, the Passion of the Christ and the Antichrist, which is basically, this is basically the format, their spreads, with two different illustrations. One on the left describes doings of Jesus. The one on the right is uh, describes what 
the Pope is up to, which is a obviously presented in a in a negative light. In this particular case, Jesus overturning the the table of the of the money money lenders in the temple. On the right, the Pope is selling indulgences. Uh, these in their time, these things uh, were call, called flugschriften or flying writings. They had an immense impact. They moved very quickly and uh, uh, had played a role that can be overstated, but they played a role in the Reformation and the speed of the Reformation. I'm the, the, whatever the technological regime is, the, uh, the question is, is less, let me go back for a second. The question is less whether, um, how the thing is made and more how persuasive it, persuasive it is. Luther was successful because his arguments were persuasive in the time. In fact, the, the Catholic church had gotten corrupt the, the critique he was offering uh, about the sale of indulgences is, of course, um, uh, a, was a big part of how the critique uh, succeeded. There's a difference when the thing that's being offered in the, in the propaganda channel is explicitly false. That's what we've been experiencing, the whole Stop the Steal campaign, which had animated the events at the Capitol is, is patently false, demonstrably false. Um, I'm just gonna very briefly go through a project. As, as I said earlier, propaganda had become, seemed like a kind of a dusty subject, but for many of those, many of our presenters today, um, all of our presenters today, the we've been roused to what does it mean as a, as a citizen to participate in a democratic society in defense of, uh, of shared values. And it turns out uh, what's necessary is to make some propaganda of one kind or another. And certainly that's what I found myself doing in this particular project a is for autocrat, <clears throat> which I I made last summer because I was I couldn't I could no longer just walk around the house and mutter. I'm just showing you some spreads. The point here was not actually so much to mock Trump, but rather to build an indictment of both positive and negative critiques in this particular place, pluralism being a core value. <clears throat> Stephen Miller as a vampire, um, I think captures a lot. That's a case where I'm, I'm using rhetoric, this, uh, uh, I guess Stephen Miller is like a vampire, uh, a simile, but I'm also using logic. I'm building it on factual material. And that's, I think, what's a critical distinction. That, that white power symbol that he's giving and that <clears throat> he, I mean, I, this is based on a photograph in the Oval Office. The, okay, the one, the, the one drop, uh, cross button on his lapel wasn't uh, on his suit, but the this is grounded in fact. That's what makes Rockwell's Four Freedoms so persuasive. Unlike the generalizing qualities of modernism, which tended, as as Stephen reminded us last night, convey a kind of conformity. Rockwell emphasized specificity, and it gives. <clears throat> his four freedoms, more power makes them more persuasive.
Al Parker maybe is, hovers somewhere in between the generalized and the specific. Um, okay, so back to back to where we are now, um, and the shift in technological regimes. The flying writings of our time are carried over the internet. What hasn't happened yet and what takes time is to build the systems that enable people to evaluate the veracity of, of information. So the communication system is ahead of the cultural filtration that's necessary to make sense of it. And that's where the a, a, a set of players comes in uh, um, is, is required. And there are writers, there are artists, there are editors, there are publishers. And so we, we are, the publishing ecosystem is one of the crucial questions of our time. And uh, for that reason, it makes every bit of sense that we're joined here today by Kevin Moran and are, we're so grateful for the support of the Berkshire Eagle uh, in this, in this in, for our little event, but also in this crucial time. So um, I'm, I'm very happy um, uh, again to be here and I'm looking forward to hearing from Kevin. Now I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. And uh, I certainly am honored to take it from here and uh, thank you for the introduction all. And on behalf of the Berkshire Eagle, it's a pleasure to team up with the Norman Rockwell Museum and its fantastic team as the media sponsor for Picturing Freedom, a Century of Illustration. And of course, it's an honor to take the football from D.B. Dowd and carry it for a little while before handing it off to our esteemed panelists. So like most of you, probably, I've long admired Norman Rockwell's The Gossips, a painting that was the cover of the Saturday Evening Post of March 6th, 1948. According to the Norman Rockwell Museum, The Gossips is one of Norman Rockwell's most famous paintings and that's saying something. But it's easy to understand why The Gossips is a fan favorite. We can relate to it. We can't help but relate since we've all been participants in this kind of daisy chain of a whisper campaign. This is of course, with the exception of everyone producing, presenting, watching and listening to this program right now. So sure, most of us don't like to associate ourselves with spreading whatever you would call it, a rumor, innuendo, falsehood, even propaganda, wittingly or unwittingly. But let's face it, we've all passed along to someone else, something about someone we heard from somebody else and so on. It's true, we can't help ourselves. There's something insatiable about, about, insatiable about it. It's an emotional need almost. We can't stand being left in the dark. After all, what's our reaction when somebody says, I know something you don't know? Isn't that the worst? And we even get indignant and say, you can't drop a hint like that without telling me what it is that you know. Now, I'm a newspaper editor. I'm not a sociologist or an anthropologist, but my observation is that gossip gets going at a pretty early age. I'm no geneticist either, but it doesn't seem too much of a stretch to say that it's part of the human condition. That for the most part, the wisdom that comes with age doesn't necessarily have an effect when it comes to this part of the human condition. In fact, some of us get better at it with age. And technology, the introduction of social media platforms has hastened and broadened our social network. And I think we can all agree that for the most part, the juicier, more outlandish the gossip, the faster it spreads. And now keep in mind that the very definition of gossip is as follows, the casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people that typically involves details that are confirmed as 
that are, sorry, not confirmed as being true. So the definition doesn't necessarily rule out that the gossip can be truthful. And isn't it strange that the more unbelievable the truth, especially those truths that are prefaced with phrases like, if it were film, no one would believe it, or this is going to sound like something straight out of science fiction, that sometimes we're even questioning the truth that we're passing along, but we do it anyway, especially if our own biases confirm it. So we as individuals may not be keen on admitting that we've perpetrated some report about someone that's not been confirmed as being true, but here's the truth I think we can all agree on, and that is every one of us has been the subject or the victim of an unchecked rumor, innuendo, falsehood, or we've been the victim of some kind of variation on a truth because that's very much the truth, isn't it? And if we're lucky, and I don't know what the percentage of the odds are when this happens, but if we're lucky, the rumors about us are true. But according to the experts, no one really is sure what the gossips are spreading, what gossip the gossips are spreading in Norman Rockwell's painting. And so we're left to wonder, we're left with questions, we're left to fill in the blanks because we have no clear answers. So did the woman in the black gloves start this story in motion with the truth? How long until the initial version of the story started to morph? Did our pipe smoking fellow at the end of the first row embellish the story along the way? Who added to it? Who subtracted to it? Is it a funny story? Embarrassing perhaps? Is it shocking? Is it a lie that hurts or is it the truth? Is it personal or political? Can't seem to tell, at least not by how our quote victim reacts upon hearing the story about him. And in fact, Norman Rockwell makes a cameo here by portraying himself as the subject of the gossip. He's the fellow in the bottom row in the tan hat with the black ribbon and wearing the striped scarf. We just know that either way, our victim is angry, that it's quite possible that these folks along the way now believe something about our victim that's not entirely accurate. accurate. At this point, it doesn't matter story is true or false. Perception has become reality. And the truth is, Norman Rockwell very cleverly snookered us into becoming one of the gossips. But what is certain, and we don't know the story, we also played right into it. And there's one other thing that's certain. This story about our man in the tan hat went viral, at least by 1948 standards. But what we're essentially looking at is Norman Rockwell's depiction, depiction of a social network and how it worked 50 years ago. To me, Norman Rockwell's The Gossips is a timeless social commentary that bears so much truth. We live in complicated times and that is even too simplistic a description. According to the Norman Rockwell Museum, Rockwell had been noodling on this idea for The Gossips for years before he painted it. But back in 1947, 1948, the world was emerging from World War II, the Holocaust a world recovering from conflict caused by deadly fascist lies and deception, ever the most deadly lies ever perpetrated on humans of all time. Those were also complicated times and the world began to come to grips with those lies. And this was the atmosphere in which Norman Rockwell must have been painting the gossips. You know, in 1944, a fellow by the name of Dr. Robert H. Knapp he was regarded as an expert in rumor, and he was actually in charge of rumor control for the Massachusetts Committee of Public Safety during the war. Who knew there was such a thing? But back then, he published a paper called A Psychology of Rumor, and Knapp, of course, put a whole great amount of work into the study of how to control rumors. And of course, during a war, rumor control is a national security concern. And Knapp observed that rumor thrives during periods of social duress. I might also say that social duress probably compels a lot of rumors. 
But for this paper, what Robert Knapp did was analyze more than a thousand rumors that were printed in the Boston Herald column called the Rumor Clinic that was published during World War II. And so he analyzed all of those rumors and he grouped them into three categories according to a summary of his paper. Well, first there was the pipe dream kind of rumor. That's the kind of rumor that reflects a, you know, a desired or wished for outcome. For example, one of the examples was given is that back then, the, you know, during World War II, if that Japan's uh, iron, uh, oil reserves were low and therefore the, end, the war would soon come to an end. And there was another category of rumors that were considered bogus or reflected fear-based outcomes, such as a surprise attack by the enemy was imminent. And there were also wedge driving rumors, according to this paper, which were intended to undermine group loyalty or relationships between folks or people. These were things like the fact, or the, these were things like, not the fact, but rumors such as American Catholics were seeking to avoid the draft or that German Americans or Japanese Americans were not loyal to the American side. So Knapp also found that negative rumors were more likely to be disseminated than positive rumors. Sounds freakishly familiar, doesn't it? Now, whether Norman Rockwell was reading psychology papers at the time while he was preparing to paint or painting the gossips, I don't know, but I'd estimate that he didn't need to read them. The country had just experienced the war and its fallout and its contemporary and resultant rumors. So in a 1947 study called the Psychology of Rumor, researchers concluded that, quote, as rumor travels, it grows shorter, more concise, more easily grasped and told. And the researchers based their conclusion on that after figuring out that 70% of the details of a story were lost by the time the fifth or sixth person shared it. Now, as a journalist, I'd like to think that had one of those characters in the gossips, perhaps the woman in the third row, the, uh, the one with the uh, phone to her ear here, she kind of looks like Lois Lane to me, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> working in the newsroom along Clark Kent. But had she been a journalist, our Lois Lane, perhaps I'd like to think that the story might have stopped there, but because it, it would have been her responsibility, her duty, her job to investigate, to go out and check, quote, the veracity of a situation, as D.B. Dowd said. So Lois Lane would have retraced the steps of the story, interviewed the previous person in line, and so on, until she got to the source of it all, the woman in the black gloves. And from there, Lois Lane would have hopefully, eventually, showed up on the steps of our so-called victim in order to interview him and set the record straight, not only for this man's sake, perhaps, but for everyone. She would have hopefully have written an accurate story vetted by her newspaper editors and put through the rigors to ensure that the story was the truth as it was understood to be. Were that the case, however, we would have had the truth. But the Saturday Evening Post, of course, wouldn't have had its magazine cover. <laughs> I've often said that journalism is like holding a public office, the, the, the highest public office to which you are never elected. Matt said, I'm proud to say that most often we do get it right. And sometimes we do get it wrong. But the difference is that if we get it wrong, we correct it. Or if we don't, the man in the hat could sue us. We could lose our jobs or worse, we could lose our credibility and integrity. And at the end of the day, the credibility and integrity that we have breeds trust. And without the trust, there's no truth and we're nowhere. So journalists have a responsibility to report on the truth, but we don't own the market on credibility and integrity. We don't own the responsibility to uphold and respect the Constitution of the United States. Communities and citizens buy new subscriptions because they want to know the truth. So therefore, journalists can get paid to do this work on their behalf so that everybody else can focus on running other parts of society. But while credibility, integrity, and trust is a hallmark of good journalism, 
citizens, civic leaders, elected officials, union workers, factory managers, CEOs, illustrators, museum directors, government workers have a responsibility to uphold the constitution, to preserve and protect it. It's called BS when they see it, to halt threats to it, to question authority and be a skeptic so as not to fall victim to fake news or calls to take up arms based on lies and deceptions. Life is hard and the truth is more often than not difficult. And too much about life comes without answers or at least satisfying ones we can all agree on and live with. Life is a mystery. And in the end, we don't like to live with mysteries because what we don't know is uncomfortable, even threatening. We like answers, but answers can be truth, some form of truth, mistakes or outright lies. But we like answers and, we, and when some of us, some among us don't like the truth, and therefore don't accept the truth, we search for other answers. Often today on social media, the internet, talk radio, extremist programming on television, or from politicians who peddle lies precisely because it serves their purpose. This is of course precisely why God created journalists and why he created illustrators and combinations thereof. And that's to pursue the truth, frame it and publish it. Provide a check on government to work on behalf of the people because we are the people. We're not an arm of the government. We're an independent arm of the governed to ensure that this Republic remains of the people, by the people and for the people. This is why the founders who, in, through, who through cap though capable as anyone to gossip and probably masters at it, in a moment of clarity saw fit to enshrine the press and the people's right to express their ideas, including to question their own government, to be the very next paragraph that follows all their signatures on the Constitution. But too many of our fellow Americans are vulnerable to information. Too many are in fact gullible, easily manipulated perhaps. Their trust in the press is eroded, not because it was necessarily earned, but because the truth is hard. And for certain people in leadership positions in government or certain people on extremist airwaves, who are themselves afraid of being vulnerable, gullible, or manipulated, they try to own it. And those who can't, for whatever reason, figure out the correct way to fill in that blank and sign themselves or live with it, they end up living in fear. And today, I think our republic is, is divided in part because of fear. But I worry about the people among us today who live in that fear. I worry about the people among us today who have been told that their freedoms are at risk. I worry about the people who can't, for whatever reason, trust that the Constitution of the United States belongs to all of us, not one side or the other, not owned more by one side or the other. I worry about the people in the country who are fearful because they've been told that the government is going to take away their Second Amendment rights or worse, that they're coming right now to their homes to take all of their guns away. It's not happening. They're living in fear because they've been told that the government is going to take away their First Amendment rights to freedom of speech. Sure, the president lost his social media platforms, but when we sign up to use private social media platforms, we all agree to their terms of service. And we know that if we break the rules on Twitter or Facebook, we get tossed. But there's still thousands of public street corners out there, and plenty of, pub plenty of soapboxes to go around. They live in fear because they've been told that their freedom to worship is under attack, in fear because they've been told that newcomers to their country and community will take more than their fair share of the American dream, leaving them wanting. Worry about these people living in fear, that they'd want to embrace and firmly believe in fraud and not just in one fraud, but potentially thousands. But this is 2021. And while we're drawing comparisons to the social network as depicted in 1948, Technology has sped up to the point that frauds are committed on social media that are then spread instantly to millions, bypassing the fourth estate, it's okay, bypassing though the fact checkers, bypassing a lot of common sense. And for some, it's satisfying their emotional need to have answers to their fears. It's not instilling confidence in the strength of their freedoms. According to the Pew Charitable Trust and its research, 86% of US adults say they get news from a smartphone, tablet, 
or a computer, often or sometimes. 64% of Americans say social media have had a mostly negative effect on the way things are going in the US today. That just one in 10 Americans say social media sites have a mostly positive effect on the way things are going in the US. And with social media, the messages of our social network are being published. And now every citizen is a publisher, a media participant. We are creators, you are creators, We're, we are sharers. And with that does come great responsibility. As we enjoy this program and learn from it and allow it to let us think, I hope we all can leave here inspired to be picturing freedom, not sharing fear. So when we find ourselves in the daily position of upholding the constitution in the middle of a social network, and lest we be so eager and quick to hit the post button or the share button, let's stop for a moment and let's all be Lois Lanes. Let's all be Lois Lanes. With citizenship comes great responsibility. Our democracy depends on us. Thank you. I'm Kevin Moran for the Berkshire Eagle. Kevin, we can't thank you enough for framing that issue so beautifully and so many of the things that uh, we are thinking about these days and question. Um, and I think the fascination of um, the psychology of rumor as you uh, explored the Norman Rockwell painting, The Gossips was really interesting. So I'll never see that painting again, the same way. <laughs> thank you so much. Wonderful to have you with us. You know, I just wanted to mention um, that the Berkshire Eagle has had a very long history, but um, since its return to local ownership in 2016, it has captured several newspaper of the year titles and general excellence awards from the New England Newspaper and Press Association. And <clears throat> Kevin has done a remarkable job uh, in steering the paper and um, in ensuring that we uh, can count on the truth and information that is printed in it. So thank you again uh, for a terrific start to our day. It's now my great pleasure to introduce panel one, uh, which is DIY print culture and citizenship. So reflecting on Norman Rockwell's representation of the ideal of freedom in his interpretation of Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, this panel will delve into a nuanced and contemporary grappling with the less than ideal when visual satire is often summoned and the depiction of villainy is necessitated. Uh, and Rockwell, of course, was not a painter of villains. With DIY print culture, the artist citizen introduces such visual political work into the great culture, greater culture with a minimum of means without relying upon a mainstream system of distribution cheaply produced pamphlets, affordable prints, and the use of social media platforms. For such artists, the question of audience engagement is crucial. How to responsibly affect a culture of political ideas from a place of independent agency. It's my pleasure now to introduce Ryan Standfest, who's been a great collaborator and coordinator of our event today. Uh, he's organized an amazing panel featuring Sue Coe, Robert Sikoriak, and Christopher Sperandio. Ryan is an artist, arts writer, and the editor-in-chief and publisher of Rotland Press, which presents satirical publications of a culturally relevant nature. His publications and prints are in numerous major collections, and his work has been exhibited widely. Ryan has penned criticism and essays for the Detroit Arts and Culture Journal, Infinite Mile, Detroit Art Review, and Essayed. He contributed a chapter to the book, Radical Dreams, Surrealism, Counterculture, and Resistance, forthcoming from Penn State University. Welcome, Ryan. We are so looking forward to this conversation and welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And I also want to thank the uh, Norman Rockwell Museum and the D.B. Dowd Modern Graphic History Library for uh, co-hosting this uh, wonderful event, which I'm honored to take part in. So uh, I am going to 
Uh, let's see, share this uh, slideshow here. Can everybody see this? Very good. Okay. So by way of an introduction uh, to this panel, uh, I hope to provide a little bit of context as to where I'm coming from and why uh, we have the three panelists that we have uh, to have a conversation today about the topic of our panel. Uh, let's see here, there we are. So in 2010, I started a press, Rotland Press, and initially the only goal of the press was to publish uh, scabrous humor. Uh, something that uh, sort of existed in that little space between what was funny and what was not funny. And I can say that this is a very small press and it makes do with a, uh, with a little bit of resources. It goes very far with a little. And what I mean by that is the press is about printing uh, projects uh, that are uh, produced cheaply, produced quickly to get into the hands of as many people as possible. But something happened in 2017 and uh, in January in 2017 in particular, uh, I had a lot of friends in social gatherings asking me uh, after the ascendancy of Donald Trump into the presidency, right at the moment of inauguration, what are you going to do? They're practically shaking me by my lapels. Now, as somebody who's not prone to peer pressure, I was nevertheless already thinking, what the hell am I gonna do? I'm not somebody who uh, marches, uh, quite frankly, and I'm not somebody who's going to take out a paintbrush and start uh, creating political slogans. I do, however, publish. That's the thing I do. I would always say when somebody would ask me, what are you going to do? I would say, do what you do best uh, when you feel the need to. So uh, I started a publication, a little chat book quickly put together called American Flytrap. And at the time, I had been researching a publication uh, that uh, was put out in 1932 and 1933 by an editor, a humorist by the name of Alexander King, who was also an all around uh, raconteur who enjoyed the uh, talk show circuit in the 1950s. And Americana was this extraordinary publication filled with cartoons and it was political, but it had this irreverence which I had not seen coming from that time in America. And uh, great artists worked for Americana. George Gross uh, created drawings for Americana while he, after he had emigrated to America, uh, William Stieg, uh, Al Hirschfield. And it was, uh, it was a no holds barred approach to uh, responding to politics with humor, responding to uh, the threat of fascism and depression, uh, the great depression with humor. Uh, so this was a fascinating model for me. Uh, in the first issue of American Flytrap, and by the way, I called it Flytrap because it's difficult to find your way out of the Flytrap. Uh, two of our panelists today contributed work to that first issue, the post-truth issue. Uh, R. Sikoriak, who you can see here, uh, created these two uh, riffs on comic book covers that responded to this notion of post-truth. And Sue Ko. And I was uh, elated when I saw this piece uh, from Sue because it was delivering precisely the kind of bitter uh, sting that I was hoping for that would last, outlast the moment that it was delivered. This could hang around for some time. And in fact, our uh, uh, figure here of Steve Bannon proved himself to be even more grotesque as time went on. And we also see Kellyanne uh, Conway assisting in this uh, process here. Uh, then uh, we moved on to American Flytrap 2. My hope was this would come out very quickly. Uh, the, this would be my attempt at a political periodical, uh, but it started to slow itself down. And uh, you know, all of my best laid plans to have the, in a, after the gun issue, to have the environment issue, the 1% issue, um, numerous political issues in which I would sort of break them down into little uh, 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 focal points to sort of make all of the, this jumble of noise more manageable, uh, it didn't come to pass. And the pandemic came along and this ended after two issues. I have to say there was probably good reason why it ended. Uh, I didn't really uh, think about the form as much as I should have. And I don't think it hit the target audience it was intended to. Uh, however, uh, as we come to 2020, uh, there was a newfound urgency within me to address the pandemic. 
and a way to find a new model. It wasn't easy for me to start pulling material together and sending it out to a printer. This was during our lockdown. Uh, many places around the country were locked down. Uh, so I decided to create a quarterly that would be released online for free. This was the first time I ever attempted that. Uh, but I found that the audience growth was uh, incredible, more so than any other uh, fashion of distribution I had tried previously. And with the Plague Review, uh, I received extraordinary responses. I would immediately email artists around the world. There were, there were a total of 85 contributors from 14 different countries. This is a terrific piece by Marcel Zama. This is uh, Peter Zahalski, uh, also known as uh, Labor Camp. And then here we have Sue Ko, who contributed uh, Dr. Maga and uh, also did an interview for the issue and Christopher Sperandio, another uh, of our panelists today who will spend more time talking about some of the work that you see in these pages. Uh, but while I was editing the Plague Review, there was yet another layer of urgency that uh, was uh, coming down upon me. And that was the uh, oncoming election as we approach November. And I had been wanting to work on another project with Sue and uh, this urgency that was building led to this particular project, American Fascism Now, in which Sue had been working uh, throughout the course of the Trump uh, period um, on a number of relief prints uh, tackling uh, the, the, the mess, the wreckage that was the Trump administration. So it seemed the right thing to pull a collection of these together very quickly into a small chapbook with a wonderful text by art historian Stephen F. Eisenman that put into context what fascism means uh, in American political culture and American culture at large. And he did a terrific thing of establishing uh, a context for fascism as it has already reared its head throughout our history. Uh, I would say that this book, uh, to this day, it is still selling quite strong. It has proven, particularly in 2020, as a uh, publisher of printed objects, print, I am happy to report, is far from dying. It is alive and well, and this book has sold more than any other publication that I have uh, printed throughout my 10 years of running Rotland Press. Um, and it is still, um, you know, moving out the door as I speak. I'm, I'm a little too slow at packaging the items because it's a one-man shipping operation, but it's doing quite well. So this brings me back to Norman Rockwell. Uh, one of the things that I find fascinating about participating in this panel, um, in this symposium, is that I would not think of pairing Rotland Press with uh, the Norman Rockwell Museum or with Norman Rockwell because uh, Rotland is indeed a bitter pill in printed form. And when I think of Norman Rockwell, and certainly when I look at his Four Freedoms, I've long thought of him as uh, someone who has a moral compass and chooses to ennoble and enlighten through um, highlighting uh, the more positive aspects of what he sees in, in domestic American culture. Um, so I often turn to uh, George Gross, uh, who interestingly enough was living in America and working while Rockwell was working. And in 1943, while Rockwell had painted uh, the Four Freedoms, uh, Gross, who was a German exile, had fled his country uh, to avoid persecution by the Nazis, found himself uh, in, a, in a very muddy place. He was uh, highly misanthropic, uh, lost in many ways in American culture, wanting to embrace the American capitalist dream, but unsure how to. Uh, in 1943, while Rockwell had painted The Four Freedoms, Gross had painted a self-portrait, The Wanderer. And as you can see, uh, there are flecks of paint on his smock, ex an explosion in the background. He is indeed lost. And it's that muddied area that interests me, that, that collision between hope and despair of uh, knowing what to do and knowing what not to do. And I can only fantasize what kind of conversation would have occurred between these two artists had they met, had uh, Rockwell left Vermont for New York to meet Gross or vice versa. And you can see here Gross painting uh, in 1943 in his studio, a portrait of uh, Cain or Hitler in hell. Uh, but I imagine that conversation uh, would be fascinating because indeed it's about uh, a collision of sensibilities. 
Uh, Gross had praised Rockwell. He praised him for his technique and mastery, but he also praised him for his universality. Uh, the notion that Rockwell could reach such an audience and Gross pined for that. Uh, but of course, the vision that he was presenting was very different from Rock Rockwell's, but I would argue it was still quite necessary. So in that spirit, uh, this panel is intended to involve a conversation about what our role as makers uh, would be uh, in terms of citizenship. Uh, how do we find an audience? How do we address that audience with what we need to address to them? Um, so within print culture, uh, there's a specific conversation that revolves around distribution. These objects that we make, that we print, how do we get them to that audience that we need to get it to? So with that, I will now move over to our first uh, panelist, uh, Sue Ko. I'd like to avoid the standard listing of uh, accomplishments. And instead I will say this about Sue. Uh, in my experience, she is a remarkably generous human being. She is ever vigilant and uh, highly devoted and dedicated to the imagery that she produces. And my hope is uh, certainly with all of the presenters today that you will get to know them through their own words and their work. And then after that, we'll have a conversation amongst one another. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ryan, are you going to thank you? Uh, good morning, comrades and others. Um, I did this one right after Biden was elected and I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. And who has more shoes than a centipede? And I was going to do a hundred shoes, but as this is a woodcut, it's too hard. So coup, I got coup right, and I got fascism right. Um, so I'm constantly striving for ways to engage people and get the content over. Next, please, Ryan. And this is just to show you I'm stuck because I did the, I'm in the middle of this one. So I have Miss Freedom who's on the um, top of the Capitol, on the top of the Rotunda building and I have the noose. And the big lie to me is capitalism and fascism is an expression of capitalism. And I was going to do the fascist mob underneath taking, attacking freedom uh, but then I thought, no, I'm more concerned with the engine driver, not the oil rags. So who funds fascism in America? And that's extremely complicated to find. Because of the slush funds of super PACs. Um, so you've got a cat and mouse kind of game going on with corporations now where they're disowning their support of the fascist former fascist, um, meanwhile still pushing money towards, um, I mean, it, let's say it's, oh, I can't even think of this. It's, it's an economic legalization of political corruption. So that's the big lie, that what can we do? How can we resist this, um, in my case, in art? Next, please. I did this before Trump was elected. It can happen here, and I have read the book, um, where I knew he's a career racist, um, an absolutely despicable scumbag. Um, as a New Yorker, I'm saying this of the past experience. And this took me about 40 minutes, and it just was went everywhere, and that was, I was pleased, but it's not good art, and this is where my concern is making what I consider to be good art, that is layers of interest containing the truth. Um, and propaganda doesn't always do that. And there's nothing wrong with the word propaganda. It just means to propagate ideas from the Roman Catholic Church, 15th century, that offices of propaganda. Next, please. And this I didn't do for the Women's March, but it went around with the Women's March. It was published many, many, many times. Um, 
that not only is he a career racist, he's an abuser of women. And it's absolutely shocking that 50% of white women voted to have their human rights taken away. <laughs> so, you know, unless the Democratic Party can find a way to govern, these conditions will keep, keep coming back, keep um, hitting us again and again. Next, please. Uh, this one, a friend who's, you know, I always work as a team of people and a friend who's a lawyer said we live in an asylum. And the contradiction to me is the more deaths there are, the higher the Dow goes. So, you know, this is the contradiction of capitalism, that it is not indicative of health that the Dow makes more profit for the 1% than uh, how can one even absorb this information? So I had him as Renfield, like eating flies, hanging off the ceiling. And I, I feel that we are in this insane asylum where we cannot even question the mental colonialization of capital. There's nothing in the constitution that demands we are cap that we have to believe in capitalism. Next, please. Um, this was when he showed up with the Bible. He didn't have it upside down. He had it back to front, actually. But this is the type of um, force used against Black Lives Matter dem demonstrators who are absolutely, in this instance and most other instances, completely peaceful, organized, and disciplined fighting for human rights, as Rockwell <laughs> would have approved, beaten, gassed, um, military, <laughs> uh, you know, you know the story. But again, this isn't good art particularly, but I got something captured there about it. Next, please. He incites fascist violence. This one is out of all of the most I'm pleased with, because it's an alliteration on coronavirus, carnivorous, and the extent of viruses coming from our imposition into other non-human person's world is astonishing. So in terms of factory farming, which are incubators for viruses, is capitalism worth this? that the meat industrial complex makes a fortune. Is this worth it to the world? Is this worth it to all the species that are being destroyed? One trillion sea creatures being murdered every year. Billions of land animals, wild animals, being destroyed for profit. This is acceptable? No, it's not. <laughs> so this has been the bulk of my work. And now, next, please. Uh, this is when he accused people of being anti-fascist. And I always assumed America was supposed to be anti-fascist. And can you imagine the irony of being accused of being an anti-fascist? <sighs> um, so again, back to the... Um, I want to say political depravity of this statement is so astonishing. Next, please. Uh, this is Mitch McConnell can't find a racist bone. And for art history purposes, this is hot John Hartfield. Um, and throwing gasoline on the flame. Um, you know, I remember the days when of the Obama birth certificate. Where is Obama's birth certificate? And this is how this, this evil creature rose to prominence by hunting down Obama's birth certificate. And it will be interesting to see, you know, how the Republicans vote to impeach or not. I mean, it's not that interesting because we know the majority of them will not. Next, please. 
Uh, this I was thinking in a very it's funny sort of scientists discover a vaccine against fascism. And I missed out on Jim Jordan, who's very triggering. We've all got remotes around to cancel out his voice. Um, so I've got Ted Cruz. And who funds Ted Cruz? I'll ask you, because it's interesting. It's someone called Thiel, who came from Black Rock, who's since had different corporations name changes. But who's funding that? And I think that's that's journalism to me, because we can say, well, Home Depot, okay, or we could say Taco Bell, which fund Trump. But it's not the whole board, it's just people within the board. So 20% of the money could be going to super PACs. Um, next, please. Uh, this is the last one, I'm showing hope. I don't have any hope, personally. I think it's very, um, it's very liberating not to have hope. Then you can go on to fight them. So hope is a thing with feathers that fights away, but flies away. But this is Stacey Abrams. So I imagine it's Stacey Abrams. What she's done to honor America is phenomenal. So yes, there's hope in that sense. Um, I think that's all. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Sue. I'm just wrestling with the technology here behind the scenes, but uh, wonderful. We, we received a question, but what I'm going to do is, if it's okay with, with you, is hold off and then uh, present all of the questions um, after all the panels are presented. Uh, but I'll throw that out there, okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's see. Let me uh, get out of here. And um, this is live television, folks. It's a little, <laughs> a little more, uh, less smooth, rather. Okay, so uh, our next panelist uh, that we're going to hear from is Arsa Koryak. And uh, once again, rather than listing uh, a number of achievements, uh, I will say this about Bob's work is that I feel that it achieves something very rare in that it's intelligence and wit and uh, conceptual rigor uh, sort of sneak up on you. You're entertained and seduced first uh, in the way he minds our uh, canon of comics language and then there's another uh, level that, uh, that you find yourself entering into. So with that, uh, if you'd like to take it over. Yes, Ryan, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here as we do. Oops, let me go to the first one. Uh, and here we go. Yeah, so yes, thank you so much, Ryan. That was, that was very nice introduction. I'm really honored to be on this panel with you all. Um, so um, I'm just gonna give a little background about myself. I usually uh, play with parodies, pastiches of uh, American comics, sometimes international comics, and I usually pair them with historical or literary sources. So I thought this would be an appropriate place to start. And um, my, often my work will adapt literary classics like Crime and Punishment or Wuthering Heights um, recently, I adapted the iTunes Terms and Conditions into a graphic novel, which is a long story. We won't get into that today. But um, after the 2016 election, I really felt like I wanted to say something about what was happening. So um, rather than go with a big publisher, I actually put out a mini comic called The Unquotable Trump, where I took quotes from the president-elect and um, inserted them into parodies of existing American comic book covers. So all of the language here is things that Trump said, and um, they're all based on specific, uh, you'll see he's like kind of battling with specific characters you might recognize from comics. So um, I made this kind of as a protest just to sort of say, I object. <laughs> uh, I don't need to say why I don't like Trump right now. But um, I put this out just to sort of get it out of my system. And my publisher asked me if I would expand it into a color book, which I was um, very happy to do. Um, 
but um, these are some of the pages from it. So I tried to cover kind of all of his aspects, all of the multitudes of terribleness he includes, <laughs> but also really keep reflecting back to American comics, which is which is where I live and, and where, um, you know, what's important to me. Um, so this is just a few pages just to give you a sense of the book. Um, uh, so that came out in 2017 and I really wanted to do something else that spoke to the moment, but I, I didn't want to draw uh, Trump anymore. And I felt like I'd said everything uh, that I needed to say. So um, I went to the constitution, uh, another literary classic that um, not everybody reads, um, including myself. I mean, I, I don't feel like I am a um, constitutional scholar by any means, but I knew this was a good, uh, piece of material to work with. Um, you know, every, every pundit says you have to read the constitution. So I did, and I made this book, uh, which like my previous work takes, um, the history of, in this case, solely American comics, uh, and use it, use it to illustrate the constitution. Um, so I'm just going to show you a bit of my, uh, layout here. These are 10 pages in progress. I'm just breaking down the text into small, uh, understandable chunks, and then and then illustrating what might happen. Um, I made a chart of characters from American comics and cartoons and animated shows that I wanted to include. Um, the idea here was to really express um, the, the the multitude of American comics as a substitute for the American people or as a stand-in for the American people. So I tried to represent age, race, and gender of creators and characters and slowly built the book up. Each page is in a different style. So I'm just gonna flip through a few of the pages here just to give you a sense. Uh, the first page on the left is a parody of Raina Telgemeier who is one of the most um, successful and great uh, cartoonists who does uh, young adult comics. I always get middle grade comics. I always get the terminology wrong, but but she has a huge fan base. And then um, I wanted to make sure that um, throughout people who maybe would recognize these characters from television shows or bumper stickers, uh, you know, or their alternative newspapers would see something in here that they might recognize, or maybe just the comics themselves, the original comics. And I, I really worked hard to make it all inclusive and to really suggest that the constitution is for everyone. And also I really wanted to play with the idea of interpreting the constitution. While the text is the complete original text, I tried to keep all the typos and punctuation as it was, um, but I wanted to make sure that uh, while the text was sacrosanct, the images could sort of talk back to it or argue with it in one way or the other. Um, and again, here's a good example of of, of representing race and gender in the comics. This is the boondocks on the left and Brenda Starr on the right. And this is maybe my favorite spread of the book. This is on the left, we have the yellow kid, which was one of the most popular comics in 1898. <laughs> and then on the right, we have Dogman, which is a super popular graphic novel series uh, that is happening right now. So whether you are 140 or five, hopefully you will see some character in here that you'll recognize. Um, and there's an index in the back in case you missed any of the references. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. So moving along here. And once again, uh, if any of you out in the audience have questions, please forward them. And we're going to reserve uh, a Q&A session after our last presentation, which will be by Christopher Sperandio. And uh, again, you know, one of the things I find fascinating about Chris's work is his ability to mine this other moment in American culture from the past uh, when uh, there's this notion that uh, comics were indicative of some sort of innocence, but Chris finds these, uh, pulls them out, uh, reworks them only to show us that there was really no such thing as innocence in American culture. It was all an illusion uh, and it continues to be. Uh, so with that, uh, Chris, if you'd like to uh, talk a little bit about your work. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for having me. Uh, I feel a little bit like a dog in the manger. So uh, just, you know, I'm going to bark for five quick minutes 
and then uh, and then uh, we'll let it uh, let it go after that. Um, so uh, here's my contact information. If you want to send me hate mail or death threats, uh, the best way is uh, is Sperandio at Rice Study to you, where I'm a, a, uh, a professor at Rice, uh, or you can find me on Instagram. Um, if anybody knows who I am uh, today, it's through this work, which was a work that I made fresh out of college. Uh, so I'm kind of a one hit wonder in that respect that uh, um, I made this collaborative project with a uh, chocolate makers uh, union in Chicago. And, and based on that work, I've been working ever since that work really sort of made me notorious. Here's my collaboration with DC Comics and the Museum of Modern Art that uh, I produced in, in 2002. Um, like I said, I teach at Rice University and uh, I teach, uh, I've managed to establish the Comic Art Teaching and Study Workshop, which is a kind of hub of comics production and also research. Uh, and I'm quite proud of the, the things that I've been able to do with, uh, with, the, with the organization. Um, uh, this is a installation shot of an exhibition in Houston in, in 2018. It, it uh, um, went to Chicago in 2019, an exhibition about uh, Mexican comic art from the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I also was uh, happy enough to uh, produce a film. This is a film about Jack Jackson that was shot uh, as he worked on his final uh, uh, graphic history. Uh, and this film was uh, premiered at Angoulême Festival in France last year, right before the pandemic. And then also through Cats, I produced this uh, monograph on a Mexican comic artist, uh, Julio Camarena, who is a really terrific comic artist and uh, completely forgotten now. Um, uh, and I'm lucky enough to have a lot of his work at Cats. Uh, I'm also an artist uh, producing comics now. Um, and this is uh, Pinko Joe, my first uh, sort of graphic novel. Uh, and it premiered uh, last year, uh, two weeks before the pandemic started. So I've got all sorts of good luck. But uh, Pinko Joe is basically a kind of looking at 1950s uh, propaganda comics. And, and in the comics in the 1950s, all the villains wore suits. And I thought, you know, that it's like today, all the villains wear suits today. And so, and so in Pinko Joe, uh, all the villains are bankers and lawyers. Uh, after the pandemic started and I'm trapped at home, I began making a kind of daily drawings and posting them on Instagram because uh, it was either that or, or, um, or my neighbors would notice a bad smell coming from my apartment after not seeing me for a couple of weeks. So um, you can visit my Instagram. There are hundreds of these at this point, and they're all a kind of expression of angst and, uh, and frustration at, uh, at mainly at the Trump administration and the, and the, um, uh, the, the hypocrisy and the lunacy that, that we witness through our screens on a daily basis. It uh, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like something out of a science fiction movie. Um, and I really enjoy that quote that Ryan, uh, I'm going to quote Ryan, uh, do what you do good. Uh, basically what I do good is uh, I get mad good. And uh, I say snarky things good. And, and so that's what, that's what the drawings that I've been producing for Instagram uh, are basically these sort of one panel um, expressions and you'll have to forgive my uh, bad language here but it really is obscene that that the rich are getting richer while uh, the rest of us are dying by the hundreds of thousands um and i think i have one more slide this is all on automatic so i didn't have to think about it but uh i'm pretty proud of some of these i really churn these out quickly i don't know that they're art I don't care if anybody else likes them, but I really do want you to follow me on Instagram. 
which is at Pinko Joe with a little underscore. And that's, uh, that's me. Excellent. Very good. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I think with that, we'll, we'll seg you into the Q&A session. Um, and I, I wish I had a little bit of whiskey over here. This is the one thing that's problematic about this, uh, this Zoom thing. We can't meet at a bar in a hotel lobby afterwards, uh, which I always find helps after presentations. But uh, I think what I'm going to do, I had a few questions drawn up, but I'm going to forward some audience questions uh, that were coming in while we were talking. So uh, let's see. The first question that I have here uh, which was in reference to Sue's presentation, good art versus getting a point across in a timely way when inspiration strikes. How does Sue balance this challenge within the scope of her practice? And I would extend that to all of, all of the panelists. Um, I think I started to do a woodcut and lino cut, which is very old school because of digital media, because they could get it out faster, which is ironic. So the paintings and drawings weren't reading on digital media, but the woodcuts were. And I think it's, you know, and we're trained, you know, I've worked for magazines and newspapers since I was 16, 15. So this is all about fast response time with forensic research, which really is a problem to me, <laughs> the forensic research part. And what uh, digital media has shown me is how fast something's working. So I could work for three years on a book and not know if the content's going to work. And it comes out and it doesn't sell five copies. Um, but with digital media, I can see how the work's being picked up, which isn't necessarily, doesn't make it good art or meaningful art. And so I think we're still exploring those aspects of quick reaction, forensic research, which is, in, as an artist, you have to drop it. You have to let go of research. Once you've absorbed it, you let it go to make art. Um, so it's oh, other people, please. That's it. Chris, you had mentioned something about uh, possibly not making good art. Well, I'm, uh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that all day. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I've got a great job. I, I work for a, a very wealthy university. And, and so I don't have to make anybody else happy. Um, I, I, it's wonderful to not have to give a shit about what people think. Um, academic freedom is, is a wonderful thing. And so, um, uh, uh, is it good art? Is it bad art? I don't know. And I don't think it's, I don't think I get to decide that really. Right. I think other people decide and, you know, with Instagram, you can track, you can really track like, Oh, people really like this one or nobody like that one. And people always like the ones that I don't like very much. So I don't know if people are a good judge of what's, of what's good or what's, what's not good. Bob, do you ever run into that debate? Good versus bad. Good versus. Should I move forward with this? Should I not? Is that does this need to be with a capital A art? Oh well, I yeah, I, I would avoid the word art if I could, just because that's. <laughs> I think I, I agree. I think that's for other people to decide. I certainly have really high standards for myself, but one thing that I've started to do in the last few years is to put out more zines, more black and white photocopied comics, um, to make work faster and just put it out. I used to put all my work on Tumblr, which was really exciting for me because I'd never had like immediate responses like that before. Um, but I come from a tradition of working for magazines and and really trying to make the work perfect. And I certainly have a lot of perfection in me. But um, when you're speaking to the moment, sometimes uh, it gives you the liberty to not uh, second guess yourself too much and to put it out there. Luckily, 
even though Instagram is forever, no one notices after a while. <laughs> Something new will come up. You know, it's a great quote from Charles Schultz about doing a daily strip. He's like, if you have a bad idea, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow you're going to have another one. So if you can keep that, if you can keep that in mind, uh, it, it liberates you a bit. Well, that certainly gets to the idea of, I mean, some of you have already mentioned this a little bit, audience, you know, do you have any sense of who your audience is? Does it matter to you to identify an audience or are you uh, just seeing what happens, you know, casting the net and seeing what happens? And I guess that what I'm going to sort of put in parentheses, another part to that question, which is this idea of mainstream and not the mainstream. Um, is it possible to make critical audience you know, within a mainstream framework? Uh, or does that level of criticality have to happen outside of a mainstream framework? Are you looking for a mainstream audience? Do you care? Uh, or are you seeing what you can get? No, I'm, I don't care about a mainstream audience. And if back to printmaking, I can make prints cheap very cheap and I can get them out fast and we can save lives. So that sounds a bit pretentious, but it's true. So someone can afford a $20 print that's never purchased art before and they've decided this is art and that money can be used immediately to save a life. So that's what I've learned with printmaking is, well, you do bad art, you're not keen on it. But someone else can afford a $20 print and they can fundraise off that and we can save a life today. We can save a life immediately. And art doesn't happen until the viewer makes it happen. So what I think of as good or bad is within myself as a professional, whatever we want to call it, artist. Um, so that's the joy of printmaking. It's got this immediate immediacy, urgency. We can we own the means of production. I've got a wonderful anti-fascist gallery. You know, they escaped Nazi Germany, so they should know fascism when they see it. And to, they help that process. Um, so What's the gallery, Sue? Gallery Saint Etienne. It means Saint Steve, because they escaped Paris. Then they were chased out of Paris. They fled Paris and came to America. And so the artists they took with them, they cherished that art. They took the art with them. And they're an amazing bunch of people with, you know, German expressionism. They took that Austrian expressionism. So I've been around that art since I've been with them. It's been a great honor to have that history. I would interject to, you know, when I was a student in uh, graduate school studying printmaking, it's a confusing experience because there was always this need to make art with a capital A and sell it for lots of money, which seemed to defy the logic of what printmaking is about. So you were a constant model of no, you can go back to what it should be and you can, you can sell it for less to reach more. So uh, what's that? Cheap multiple. Yeah. Yes, cheap multiples. And I still, you know, uh, that voice is constantly in my head. And I, and I thank you for being part of uh, the group of artists that stuck with that. So, um, Chris, uh, Bob, any, any thoughts on that, on that question where we were about audience and mainstream versus not mainstream, above ground versus, I don't know if there's an underground anymore, but independent. I've always tried to make my work accessible in that I always try to use uh, sources that people will recognize, but then what I combine them with is totally up to me and it's just my own obsessions. So the terms and conditions book I did, uh, I didn't expect anyone to want that, but <laughs> I made it for myself as an experiment and people really responded to it and they read a lot into it. They <clears throat> kind of like what I think Sue said earlier about people making it art, it's like people resp people's response to it were more varied than my initial idea. And you don't know that until the audience sees it. But, um, but my relationship to the audience varies from project to project.
Let me ask a question. Sue, you carve these things by hand? Yes, I've got the little tools. You know, if you do wood carving, the most important part of this is sharpening. Because <laughs> I learned how to do this myself, but it's sharpening. And it's part of our trauma is gouging into lino, you know, because America's going through a trauma right now. It's not related to your question. And it's, a, it's an emotional trauma memory. And I'm worried when America has trauma, bad things happen, worse things. Remember 911. But the process of making this work is really organizing my own. Oh, this is so traumatizing. You gouge in, you're surrounded by chips of wood flying everywhere and lino, and it's messy, but it's sharpening. That's what I'd say. You've got to keep your tools sharpened. <laughs> Otherwise, you cut yourself. <laughs> uh, that must be really hard on your hands, though. But it's 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 hard on your hands if you have to wiggle the tool because you're not keeping it sharp. Hmm. If it's razor sharp, like I've cut myself and I don't even know because it's so sharp. So hopefully, as cultural workers, we can <laughs> stay sharp. Um, that's it. <laughs> All right, Ryan, sorry for that. I just, you know, I, I studied printmaking and I know how sure. uh, hard that can be on you physically to do that physically. It does involve blood sometimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, much blood over the years myself and witnessed many students um, handling the tool incorrectly, despite what one tells them not to do. But um, so uh, do we want to take a few more questions from the audience or... Uh, Let's see, or Chris, did you have any thoughts about, I'm still gonna steer you back, mainstream, not mainstream, do you care? Is it all the same? Uh, Netflix is welcome to contact me about adopting <laughs> uh, COVID capitalism, eat shit losers into a, a series or a, a movie. No, Pinko Joe, man, that's that's your next, uh, you know, big budget uh, film. You know, with any luck, the Koch brothers will buy it and and uh, just you know flip flip the meaning around, invert the meaning like they like to do. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, work makes freedom, kind of uh, <laughs> nasty uh, nastiness. Right. Um, uh, you know, I skirted with a little bit of uh, uh, notoriety. I, I don't need it. Screw them. Yeah, there, there, there's freedom uh, when when somebody's not watching over you. So yeah, well, they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not to go all QAnon on you, but uh... <laughs> I just always assume somebody's watching me. Yes, I just live with that, and there's always guilt. Nevertheless, that's another that's another conversation, but. Um, so, uh, we're, we're close to our finishing time here and I guess we could, you know, we should wrap this up and allow the next panel to start, but I want to thank everybody for participating in this. It's been an honor for me, uh, to chair a panel with the three of you, uh, whose work I've long admired, continued to admire, and I look forward to what you're going to work on next. Uh, so I, I thank you for joining this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you all. Well, we have been thrilled and honored to listen to your conversation. It was truly outstanding and um, so enlightening. So thank you all. Uh, we will take about a 15 minute break. That means our second panel will begin at about 1145. So we'll see you in just a few minutes. Thanks, everybody.
Hi everyone, we'll be starting up in about two minutes. Welcome back, everybody. And um, we are so thrilled to uh, continue this fantastic day with uh, another group of rather remarkable artists. Uh, to give you a little background on our next panel, our publishing ecosystem is in need of attention as local journalism falters, media consolidation intensifies, and social media contributes to the spread of disinformation collectively undermining the factual basis upon which argument depends. The veracity of online outlets can be hard to establish. The cultural filtration systems we rely on to evaluate sources will develop, but they will take time. For now, existing publications and institutions must step in to underscore and support our shared democratic values. Freedom of expression for artists working within mainstream publishing will be explored by D.B. Dowd, um, who will chair this discussion with our three exceptional illustrators, and I will just introduce them briefly and turn the program over to Douglas. Rudy Gutierrez is an illustrator and educator born in the Bronx, New York, of Puerto Rican heritage, and he's raised in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's been a professor of illustration at Pratt Institute, where he has taught since 1990, and his work has appeared in films, and performances on US postage stamps, LP and CD covers, posters, and so much more. His artwork for Santana's Shaman was used as a set design at the 2002 Super Bowl halftime show, and his paintings have been commissioned for Chasing Train, the John Coltrane documentary. His art is included in the collections of musical icons, Carlos Santana, Clive Davis, and Wayne Shorter, and his children's books have earned many awards, including a Caldecott Honor Award. Rudy's recent poster, Sacred Scream, Humanity Not Politics, was one of six works that we were very fortunate to commission 
uh, by the Norman Rockwell Museum prior to the 2020 election to help inspire people to vote. Anita Kunz has been appointed an officer of the Order of Canada, Canada's highest civilian honor. Her work has been published regularly in Time, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and many others. And she has illustrated more than 50 book jacket covers. Anita teaches and lectures at universities and institutions uh, internationally, and we are honored to feature Anita's work as part of the permanent collection of the Norman Rockwell Museum. We were also so pleased to feature her poster illustration, Every Vote Counts in the Museum's Unity Project, uh, which we believe hopefully did help to get out the vote. Nora Krug is a German American author and illustrator whose drawings and visual narratives have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, A Public Space, and in several anthologies. Her visual memoir, Belonging, a German Reckons with History and Home was chosen as a best book of the year by the New York Times, The Guardian, NPR, Kirkus Review, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Boston Globe, and that really just scratches the surface. Her visual biography, Kamikaze, about a surviving Japanese World War II pilot was included in Houghton Mifflin's Best American Comics and Best Non-Required Reading and her animations have been shown at the Sundance Film Festival. Nora is Associate Professor of Illustration at Parsons School of Design in New York. Thank you to all of our panelists. And with that, I turn it over to Douglas, our moderator. Thank you, Stephanie. And thanks to uh, Anita Rudy and Nora for being with us. Um, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna get right to this. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, the, the converging issues uh, building on our last panel have something to do with uh, publishing and speech and professionalism and citizenship. And our, our panelists are all in the mix um, in those subjects. So um, we're gonna, each of our panelists will make a presentation starting with Anita, and then we uh, will have uh, a little bit of a moderated discussion uh, as with the last panel. So Anita, you're up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I mean, I just wanna say how inspiring that last uh, panel discussion was. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, so, okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go directly to the work. Um, let's see. All right, so. Uh, sorry about this, I'm not kind of a Luddite. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, okay, sorry. Ah, okay. Um, okay, I've, I've uh, been very fortunate to have been able to work in the mainstream media for uh, three to almost four decades, actually four decades. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if we're gonna be talking about the mainstream media, I think we also need to talk about the way things used to be versus the way things are now. Um, uh, I was very, I kind of added these slides late last night because of, uh, particularly because of Steve Heller's amazing talk. I was always so inspired by the work of Artsy Baishaf and, and uh, Schick, and also my great hero, Suko, uh, Ralph Steadman, Russell Mills, people like that. Um, but so this is the kind of work that I was doing way back then. This was about a Nazi war criminal they found living in Toronto, quietly. And you can absolutely see the influences. Um, I think I did this when I was 25 years old and the idea that that I was that I was given complete freedom, complete creative freedom to do this um, incredible book way, you know back then kind of speaks to the kind of autonomy that illustrators used to have and I think we have a lot less now. Um, this was something for the the I did for the great art director Fred Woodward. 
um, about the cocaine trade between North and South America. And I think one of the most important things to talk about when you talk about working for the mainstream media is a relationship with, with an art director. And it, it can't happen. You know, we can't have respect and autonomy between artists um, and, and the audience without having an incredible art director that really allows illustration to flourish. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to some of the great art directors I work with, Louis Fishoff, Fred Woodward, Steve Heller, of course, Arthur Hochstein, uh, Gail Anderson, and uh, Francoise Mouly now. So this is the kind of thing that I used to do for decades, you know, political satire in mainstream publications. You know, here's Nixon as the emperor without clothes, um, Ronald Reagan around the time of the Iran-Contra, scandal, uh, trading arms for hostages. Uh, you know, I think I've done pretty much all the presidents since uh, Carter. And there was never any problem with this. You know, I mean, th th there was, I wonder if a lot of this stuff would be published now, maybe, I don't know. Um, currently, I'm doing as much work as I possibly can for Francoise Mouly because this is the, what I'm finding now is, uh, the covers for the New Yorker, I mean, they're few and far between, but the ability to self-generate the ideas and, um, and, and make images about things that I'm really concerned about, um, there aren't that many mainstream publications, and, and we can talk about this later, but I'm not finding that many um, anymore where I can consistently do this kind of work anymore. So um, this was when the US invaded Iraq and this was at the end of uh, Bill Clinton's presidency. I mean, I, I sort of recall, you know, come, some of these ideas were just kind of sweet and charming, and this is called um, Happy Trails. Uh, but, there, but there was also, I was also allowed to do images that were, um, that were things that I was very concerned about, the privatization of water, the, you know, probably what will be the next thing next to oil over which there will be bloodshed. Um, so as far as the mainstream media goes, you know, the, the, this is kind of my sort of go-to for submitting ideas now. Um, this, this one, I wanted to do something about how women feel we need to, um, you know, show ourselves in, in varying in uh, all the different cultures. Um, you know, I've, I've always wanted to try and do images that have a deeper meaning. This was for the, I think, the week after July 4th. And I just wanted to do kind of a little reminder that, you know, New York was uh, founded on the backs of Indigenous people. So there's always, I mean, for me, ever since I was a kid, my uncle was an illustrator. And um, from him, I, his motto was art for education. And from him, I learned that art could be actually of service and it could, it could provide some meaning and at least uh, some dialogue in the culture. This is called Silent Night, Endless Fight about the soldiers who, you know, have to do endless tours of duty. Um, and of course, this is called Dangerous Toys. I think, I mean, the, the great thing about uh, being able to work with Francoise is, uh, and, it, and I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know whether she has the final say. I suspect not. I suspect the editor does. And I think one of my, one of the things that I've certainly been noticing over the years is that art directors seem to have far less say than editors do. So I think it's a bit problematic when editors start art directing. But anyway, that's my personal beef. Oh, wait, something just happened here. Okay. Well, I mean, do we remember intelligence, grace, integrity, compassion, complete sentences? I haven't done too many pictures of what's his name, but um, this is one that I did that, that uh, was based on the, the great George Lois uh, Esquire cover called Media Monster. And I'm, I'm finding that the older I get, the more 
I want to do um, self-generated work because the idea of sitting around waiting for the phone to ring with the perfect job is not just not something I'm willing, you know, or, or I have the patience to do anymore. So I've done a lot of posters for the, these were for the Women's March. This is something I did for the Wolfsonian that uh, Steve Heller was responsible for. So that was a series of three posters. And then I'm, um, I work with a Turkish organization out of Istanbul and it, they, it's actually a cartoon competition, but what they really try to do is uh, build dormitories in the, in the country for uh, girls so that the, the parents will let the girls go to school so that they're not married off at a very early age. You know, um, I've always been a big supporter of artists' rights and that we're paid properly and, and all that stuff, but I think uh, just as important is that we have, we have a voice in the culture and, and money is great. And of course we have to pay our bills, but you know, our, our voices are so critical and so important and we have such a great responsibility to, to you know, use them wisely. This is the Mirko Illich uh, tolerance show that's going around Europe right now. So, um, one thing that I've started to do is um, I started to do a lot of personal work. This is, this is a book that will be released by Fantagraphics in August. And it's really another history of art. I've, I always was very aware when I was an artist, a young artist, or even before that in art school, that it, doesn't, it didn't seem that the history of art was my history. It was a different history. And so I came up with the idea to sort of revisit a lot of works of art. Um, as if they had been done by a secular uh, female, me. So, um, so I did, you know, a whole bunch of paintings and I was able to, I'm very lucky that I was able to um, sell this to Fantagraphics. And the other thing I did was that on the inside, I wrote about, um, I wrote the biographies of these men, but I changed the pronoun to, to women. And it was amazing how, how differently it read. You know, you realize that it would never have happened. So that it, it was a really interesting way to make a point. Um, and this is my last slide. This is, um, this is my COVID project. One thing that I've always wanted to do, but I've never been able to, you know, find the time is to, is to do portraits of women I admire and women who, you know, you know, once I started doing the research, I realized I'd never even heard of half of these women. And I, I believe that they should be honored. I believe everyone should know their names. Um, and I've done, this is six, I've done 180 so far. And the longer the lockdown goes on, the, the more I'll be able to do. But this, um, I, I shopped this around and this was, I'm so grateful that it was bought. And this, uh, a book will be out in November of, of uh, this series. And, you know, we're trying to make it as accessible and joyous and a celebration of women um, as, as we possibly can, making sure that every, absolutely everything is about it is accurate. And um, anyway, yeah, I've got a great publisher and I don't know if I can talk about it yet, but um, I'm thrilled to be able to do this. And this could probably <laughs> be my project for the rest of my life, but anyway. Um, and that's it, thank you very much. Okay, Rudy, you're up. <clears throat> All right. All right. First of all, thanks for having me and, and thank you to all the people who've, who've showed up to listen to us, I incredible. Um, I like to tell this story about watching Bob Marley get interviewed, right? And we have a cameraman that's following him. And, you know, Bob is about, I don't know, five, three, five, four, you know, short stature, but a giant, you know? He's walking up the stairs onto the stage. And the interviewer is asking him as a camera pans the audience and there's, probably a hundred thousand or more people waiting for this, this little dude to get up there and do his thing, you know? 
And so the interviewer asked him, so Bob, what are you thinking when you go to play, you know? And Bob replied, well, you know, I'm not going to play. I don't go to play. And I said, yeah, Bob, I, I hear you. That's what it's about. You know, so what is he talking about? For me, it's, you know, he said, I go to conquer. I go to conquer. And for me, he's conquering complacency, ignorance, and most of all, fear. You know, and look at where fear has us in this country right now. You know, for me, doing art is, uh, is really about uplifting and inspiring, but also with the highest part being maybe, maybe I can humbly speak for people who don't have a voice. You know, it's about the responsibility of truth in, in terms of, of our vision, you know? And that truth filters through my lens as a person of color, more specifically, as someone of, with Puerto Rican descent who acknowledges my African and indigenous blood. So all of that goes into who I am and what I do with no separation. Um, this first piece, and I'm just gonna show a few slides. I'm not gonna speak that much because I have a six minute um, slide video, which I think will say what I need to say with some music. Um, Music is a big influence on me. Um, we the people, you know, it's about inclusion. It's about being able to walk through that front door. Look at the events of January 6th, the, you know, the, the, the atrocious events and how people could walk through that front door. That's incredible to me. I would not have been allowed. And I'm light-skinned Puerto Rican. Imagine a darker-skinned Puerto Rican. I, I, uh, I look at the whole industry and I think about, you know, and we're here to talk about mainstream, you know, marketing as, you know, as opposed to uh, personal work, that kind of thing. And we all do all of it, you know, but mainstream marketing or mainstream clients which I've done, you know, certainly a lot of editorial work for newspapers and magazines, that kind of thing. Really, I, I can attribute that to making me get even more personal, even more personal with the work because I felt like I was going through the side door very often. And by that, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I was doing a lot of general media work. And unfortunately, I would get called typically to do, and I say in quotes, Hispanic subject matter, you know, and, and my thinking on that is like, no, that's not my panic, that's his, you know, and, and I realized I had to start making changes um, that exemplified exactly who I am, what I want to say, and let the chips fall where they will, you know, and I started doing more personal work, and with no regard to who was gonna hire me. Yes, I lost clients, but I gained other clients. And I, I also found that I had a, a better ability to speak my truth through my lens. So it, it behooves me or, or disturbs me actually, when I see a history of illustration and we get to the, you know, the area where we're gonna talk about politics or social issues, and I rarely see a brown or black artist um, for the kind of work that they do and we do. And, you know, it's incredible that our pain is being portrayed by someone else, you know? And I, I see this often. Again, it's that side door. So, and don't get me wrong, I've, I've um, you know, I've had the pleasure of, of working in this, you know, huge market and, you know, being in it, you know, um, but some of the realities are, are still there, you know, they're still there, you know, so, and, and I'm talking literally as well, you know, in the days when we used to deliver work, I'd, I'd show up at the front desk and be sent to the freight elevator, 
<laughs> and you know, I'm like, no, I'm here to see an art director. You know, so it's a constant fight, constant. You know, it's it's constantly fighting privilege, desecration of culture, etc. You know, I don't see enough of us being used to portray this evil, to portray this pain, you know? And, and there are great people who, who are not people of color who are doing it, but there are others who are like Pat Boone doing Little Richard, you know? I mean, come on, you know, Mick Jagger doing Muddy Waters. Let, let's get pure, let's, let's tell the truth, you know? And I put this slide just to be, uh, uh, just to be inclusive of uh, another part of me, which is, you know, doing album covers. I do children's books. I do book covers. Um, but the thread is always culture and social justice. So, you know, yeah, I, I can show a bunch of uh, social justice pieces, but I think it's also important to talk about the idea of culture as our power base. So whatever I do, it's always gonna be inclusive of culture, whether it's a children's book, you know, or, or a book cover or an album cover. That's, that's really what's important to me. And the other reality is that, yeah, I know that I've given up certain marketplaces and that's okay, you know? Um, again, it's for me about whether I'm speaking to a mass audience or a small audience, it's speaking for my people and coming from my lens. I was honored to be asked to do this uh, by the Norman Rockwell Museum. Um, and it was, you know, it had to do with getting the vote out. And I would not have been interested in voting just for the sake of voting, unless I could be inclusive of the atrocities going on and one way of combating it, which is voting. And this is called sacred scream. And it's a scream that many people of, of color have, you know, that's just not heard. Yeah, it's time to clean up this mess, but that's gonna be difficult, you know? You know, does cleaning up this mess mean sweeping these people back under rocks? Or does it mean changing people's hearts and spirits, which is gonna take a very long time? But it is time. So that brings me to uh, this little slide video. It's for a song called Revolution by my wife, DK Dyson, who's a huge inspiration to me, has always been supreme artist, supreme songwriter and musician. Um, it's gonna start out with a little invocation, which is inclusive of uh, God, you know, spirit, um, culture, you know, calling on the spirits, uh, indigenous spirits, African spirits, um, and then going to the streets and talking about revolution and the whole idea of there needs to be a revolution of the mind. Oh! 
starts in your mind, indeed. Uh, that's the music of DK Dyson, my wife. One thing to remember is when I come through that door, even if it's the side door, even if it's the damn side door, I never, ever come alone. I come with my ancestors, my mother, my father, my brother, all of them are with me, my uncle, you know, and they allow me to speak for them. And that's what I find so important. You know, um, I find that art is magic. I find that it inspires, it's a damn weapon. It's medicine used to heal soul wounds. And you know what? If it makes one not feel alone in his or her visions, or it serves as transportation to a higher self, and I do believe that it does, then that's where I live, you know? That's where I live. And thank you for inviting me to step in this particular front door. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rudy. You're welcome. That, uh, that video is extraordinary. Thank you. Inspired by the music. <laughs> that, well, the, 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 uh, the audio visual word image is just amazing. Just amazing. Thank you. All and right. I, I just wanted to say one more thing in, in yes. conjunction with, with what I was saying, and that is, um, you know, when we do these history of illustration things, it's real important not to forget, you know, our black artists, brown artists who are out in the streets. You know, I grew up uh, coming of age as a teenager between the 60s and the 70s and the civil rights movement and the social movements, the hippie movement, uh, Black Panther movement, AIM, the Young Lords, and they all had artists who were doing their thing, but it wasn't on this grand scale where aesthetics um, were judged by someone else, but more so by the people who they were required to touch. It was an interesting conversation before where we were talking about what's good art. You know, well, let's really talk about that. Is, isn't it, doesn't it get down to the aim of it and how that aim is satisfied? You know, so, you know, I beg people, don't forget the artists who were handing this, this stuff out in the streets, touching people on the spot, painting signs. We're talking about Emery Douglas of the Black Panther movement, Tom Feelings, who was doing it in children's books and won the first uh, African-American to win the Caldecott Award, Jim Satu Dyson, my brother-in-law, who was part of the Black Panther movement doing art. So. Don't forget us. Thank you. Well, I just wanna, I wanna underscore that. The, the, the history of illustration is, it's improving, but it has been a woefully underdeveloped field and it's sort of been the history of style. Sure. And a lot of people are doing good work and many of them are actually present today. Um, and we we collectively have a lot of have a lot of work to do. The history of graphic design has a lot of work to do, and and the points you're making are a hundred percent accurate and very pressing. Steve Heller made a a, a comment in the chat. I just want to pull up. Um, uh, Rudy, you're so eloquent and moving on the core paradox about political art, specifically art in general the sense that in the 21st century prejudice in art has been erased is so wrong and it has just been camouflaged by wishful thinking. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's our responsibility to fill that vacuum that's made by politics and religion where they fall short. The truth is on us. Rudy, I'll just jump in to mention that uh, this important point that you bring forward is uh, also one that is really closely under discussion at museums right now throughout the nation and the world. 
Absolutely. And I think that's been uh, a very important advancement in thinking and hopefully it will uh, help to move uh, those ideas forward. Thank you for that exceptional uh, presentation. Thank you and, and thank you for the support that you've shown as the Norman Rockwell Museum, absolutely. All right, um, our, our last panelist is Nora. And um, Nora, you have the floor. Can you hear me? The first yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone uh, organizing this. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to the, the two panelists for all this inspirational work and the conversations we just had, which are very, very, very important. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, oops, sorry. And I'll see if I can make this um, full screen. I hope it works. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. It's going to collapse you all, sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about two different projects um, that I've recently been working on. Um, one that was published in 2018, which is the one featured on the screen uh, called Belonging, a German Reckons with History and Home, um, by, published by Scribner. And also uh, the current project I'm working on um, that is going to be published this year by 10 Speed Press. Um, Belonging is a 280 page fully illustrated visual memoir about World War II and my own German family history. Oops. Um, the uh, atrocities that my country Germany committed during World War II obviously cast a long shadow all throughout my childhood. And my years as a teenager were accompanied uh, by a tremendous sense of inherited guilt. But even though we learned a lot about the Holocaust in school, um, the page on the right um, on the left is a is actually an excerpt of a speech by Adolf Hitler that I had to analyze as a as a teenager in school. Uh, even though we learned so much about the Holocaust in school, um, our guilt uh, grew into a somewhat um, abstract guilt, and conversations what happened about what happened in our own families remained largely non-existent. And by the time I learned about the Holocaust, all my grandparents had died. And I felt that I had missed my chance to ask them directly about their lives under the Nazi regime. And so my guilt and the, the gaping hole that was my family's history uh, left me with a feeling of emotional paralysis and connected to that a sense of, of cultural disorientation, which I think a lot of Germans still feel today because our sense of national identity is still very deeply uh, tied to the Nazis' um, uh, atrocities. And as a German living abroad for 20 years, I've often been aware that my accent alone can evoke the memory of the Nazis' crimes. And living as a German amongst non-Germans has also um, grown my urge over the years to confront my own family's history within the bigger framework of German history um, uh, from a new perspective. Um, and I, I felt a stronger urge to ask those questions that I had never had a chance to ask before. So through a combination of short comics and full page illustrations, as well as photographs, um, the, the book follows my journey as I seek out lost relatives in the village where my father was from, pictured on the right page. Um, consult archives for evidence, for any evidence about my family's life under the Nazi regime. Uh, and the book also follows um, in particular the lives of two people, uh, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather pictured on the left, who was a driving teacher during the war and also a Nazi party member, which is something that I, or my family only found out um, while I was doing the research on the book. Um, and my paternal uncle who died as an SS soldier in Italy at age 19 and whose grave we discovered by sheer coincidence as a family during a family vacation in Italy when I was a child because his remains were buried there. 
um, through, through this visual memoir, I hoped to gain a clearer understanding of the effect that war has over generations and the effect that uh, it had on my family, uh, you know, the personal effect it has, war and history has on lives every day and in every country really. Um, but it also um, was an opportunity for me to try and understand what German cultural identity means to me um, and um, how it can be understood both on a personal and a collective level. And this is a question that has still remained vague and obscure and elusive to me. Um, is, there, is there really such a thing as cultural identity? Uh, is it something that's static or does it evolve continuously? Uh, how can we portray this idea of cultural identity and the histories that come with that uh, as artists? Um, the second book I want to talk about is the book I'm currently working on. It's uh, called On Tyranny. Um, it's written by the wonderful American historian, Timothy Snyder. Um, this is the original edition um, that was published, I believe in uh, 2016, uh, right after the elections. And it is a highly, highly relevant book um, about what's going on uh, in America today um, you know, uh, very relevant to all of the things that basically everybody who spoke today has talked about. Um, so it's called On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. And as the title suggests, it is a book that talks about um, how we can learn from 20th century history, uh, what we can take from that, uh, and how we can avoid um, those things that happened during um, those horrific times um, under various regimes will never happen again. Um, and the book is divided into 20 chapters that are 20 suggestions or 20 notions that we need to uh, really be aware of and be sensitive towards in order to recognize the beginnings of tyranny um, so that we can learn how to interfere basically. Um, and uh, to me, it was a wonderful project to work on because first of all, I, I admire Timothy's work and for those of you who are interested um he just has he has a, an article in today's new york times magazine about what's currently going on um and also because it uh, represented a, an opportunity to continue this endeavor of um asking how the personal and the political intersect and what is our responsibility as human beings as citizens but also as artists in, uh, in shaping polit political notions and in, in uh, providing more complex insights into history and what's going on presently in the world. Uh, and also uh, into how war and conflict uh, can impact our thinking today, how our, you know, our experience with war and, and, uh, and conflict. Um, so I'm going to sh show a few examples from this book. Um, this speaks specifically to the history of the Nazi regime and the idea of us being spectators and uh, bystanders um, as you know, the Jewish population basically disappeared. Um, this is a chapter about investigating and the importance of investigating facts, of believing in facts and in truth. Uh, and um, the picture on the right talks about the idea of indifference um, so this was my idea of, of portraying the sense of, of looking away or, you know, there's always this, this idea of when to look and when not to look and that that's a personal choice and um, that it is obviously our responsibility to look and to witness. Um, and I think images in the history of illustration, obviously, obviously as uh, Steve Heller um, showed yesterday and DB um, also has been showing a lot in his, in his talks, um, it is our responsibility as illustrators to witness uh, and to see ourselves as witnesses and to, um, to show, you know, to show truth basically. Um, there's also a chapter on, on deception and uh, alternate, um, you know, alternative truths and uh, conspiracy theories. I had a lot of fun illustrating that because, you know, it's so bizarre and, um, Outworld, uh, out, 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 world dish. I don't know. That's a word. Um, so these two pages are from that chapter. Uh, Snyder talks about uh, shamanistic and incantation. Uh, you know the idea of, 
which is something that Adolf Hitler did and, and Donald Trump did as well, of constantly repeating the same uh, falsehoods over and over again, and also assigning particular names and words to those, you know, terms like crooked Hillary that he just repeated over and over again until those words basically sank into people's brain and they became just the fabric of everyday understanding of who Hillary Clinton is and um, transformed her in the minds of people. So that's the power of shamanistic incantation, which I try to portray through having this shifting, uh, you know, transformation that's going on in, in this female character on the page on the right. Um, he also talks about um, magical thinking, um, the idea that Donald Trump presented, um, uh, you know, uh, possibilities that don't actually exist um, by inflating, um, inflating lies. Um, so in, in addition to just uh, coming up with lies, also inflating ideas, making seem, them seem grander than they are. And another mode he talks about is the idea of misplaced faith, um, putting yourself uh, as a tyrant um, into a, a kind of a space that's almost godlike. Um, and uh, so that's what the page on the right hand side um, symbolizes. Um, he, uh, he quotes um, uh, several great people in the book and there's one, um, uh, one moment in the book talking about Ionesco, the Romanian playwright uh, uh, and his um, observing how friends around him turned into, into Nazis. And so I created this upside down image on the left page um, showing a university professor. You see, hopefully you can see that based on the way I designed the hat. But then when you turn around the book, which I can't do now because I can't, don't want to turn around my computer, um, the face turns into that of a, of a Nazi wearing a Nazi uniform. Um, and then on the right hand page, Timothy talks about um, propaganda don't have to explain what it is. We've heard uh, about it a lot today, but I chose, so my, my goal for the whole book was to try to find images that don't directly turn his ideas, uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, translate them one-on-one. -on -one. So I didn't want to show an example of propaganda on this page, but I thought about how propaganda could be expressed in a different way. Uh, for instance, in this case, by um, showing a shadow figure. Uh, so somebody making something else of something that is really very harmless. Um, I think that's all for my images. Um, yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit, I was, or we were asked to also talk about um, the relationship between uh, publishers or clients um, and our work as illustrators. And I can say that uh, as, at least with these two project, uh, projects, I've been incredibly lucky, both with my publishers and editors and um, and the author, uh, Timothy, that um, I've been given just so much support. Uh, and the, I mean, obviously the whole idea of these books was to question uh, common notions of history and, um, and truth um, and to try to, um, you know, shed a more critical viewpoint on how people think about um, history and, 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 and what's going on presently in this country and in the world. And so um, obviously the, the, the goal of these projects was to, to, to ask critical questions. So I've been very, very lucky, lucky to be, have been working with authors, editors and publishers who supported that idea. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And yeah, thank you. All right, so um, I have I have a few questions, but I I'm, I want to actually get to uh, a question from uh, the the Q and A from uh, from my colleague John Hendricks. Um, uh, John asks uh, all three of you. Given the recent news about Simon and Schuster dropping Josh Hawley's book, how do those of you who work in big five publishing think uh, 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 about the responsibility of what else your publisher has in their catalog?
do you do you feel just extending that? Um, I mean, one of the questions uh, that uh, I'm going to ask as a follow up is sort of like, what on how do you say what are the what are the terms or under the condition uh, uh, the conditions under which you say no to a project? But um, taking a step back from that, this is more John's question is a little more precise. Do you feel accountable in choosing to work for a publisher, given whatever else? other things they're issuing. And, and given the, the consolidation of publishing, that's a big, that's a big landscape. I mean, you know, I think as, as Rudy uh, indicated earlier too, um, obviously there's no publisher that does not have a history of publishing questionable books. And uh, a lot of publishers are only uh, beginning now to develop a consciousness um, you know, to be more inclusive, but also exclusive of those who, uh, you know, are problematic. And so um, I think, I think for me personally, when you, obviously I would never publish a book with a publisher who has a strong history of publishing questionable content. Um, but, I, but I, uh, and I would hope, I would hope to be published by, by people whose, you know, whose efforts are going towards the right direction. Um, but I, I don't know how possible it would be. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question because it puts the responsibility on us too as co-authors. Uh, co sure. um, but I don't know, I, I mean, it's a very complex question because you, if you publish a book that actually tries to help with the effort of breaking down these misconceptions, that will also help the publisher change their perspective so um you know i think it i think it's a complex question and i don't know the answer yeah it, it truly is um you know i think back to uh when south africa you know and and had their system of apartheid and how they were trying to get various artists to go there and, and athletes and so many turned them down and others you know didn't and they had excuses that hey this I, they're going to be able to see who we are you know, I think it's a one-on-one -on -one basis, depending on who the publisher is or who the so-called client is. Um, I think you have to explore it on a single basis. You know, I, I applauded the people who refused, turned down millions to go to South Africa um, to play tennis, like John McEnroe or Arthur Ashe, you know. I mean, there, there were all kinds of, of uh, enticing situations and they had the morality and it really does get down to morality and humanity but again on a one-on-one -on -one basis because who's who's deciding what's good and evil you know with within let's say a publisher so i mean you got to be real careful with that i know that i've personally um turned down jobs you know when i very much needed the money um one of them was the NRA contacting me. Now, I didn't care what the article was, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, they, they offered X amount of dollars. They came back um, a month later after I turned it down, offered more money to do another article. And what I realized is that I would be used for their agenda. I mean, that's all that was about. And, they, and the arrogance that they could just buy me, you know, um, so I, I refused, you know? Now, there are some situations where um, you go, okay, what's the trade-off? There was no trade-off there. Sometimes there is a trade-off in terms of like, okay, can I say X, Y, Z? And is that gonna be of assistance? And, and, and am I voicing the concerns of the responsibility that I have to people of color, let's say? You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's complicated like Nora says. It, it really is. And it's just a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that too. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, sort of with this vast audience that we have, um, you know, like if, if we're in any, you know, if, if so many people buy your book or if you're in a magazine or whatever, it does come with great responsibility. And I think we all have our own particular line in the sand and that it has to do with what you can sleep with, <laughs> you know, like what can I sleep at night, honestly. Um, I've certainly turned down a lot of work and I've 
had some curious arguments with people who who literally told me I was crazy and you know I mean but you know can I sleep you know can I sleep at night no so um I think one of the, the the great things one of the very positive things about being a freelance illustrator is that you can turn down work you know if, if we were working you know with uh, for somebody else that would be much more difficult and that would be a much bigger sacrifice right but I mean turning down uh, the occasional job because it's just <laughs> You just can't uh, bring yourself to do it. I think is something that's pretty normal for people who I think who uh, freelance. I mean, we we can design our own careers. You know, we you know it's not always easy, but it's you know like we get to figure out who we want to work because context is just as important as 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 what you're doing as the Absolutely. image and what you're trying to say. It's context. Sure. So the if there's a if there's another maybe a, another leg on that stool there's there's the work that you do there's the work that a publisher issues whether or not that publisher has hired you as a freelancer or is 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 issuing your project um the third element is audience and what kind of experiences have you had through your audience that maybe shape or inflect your you're thinking about what you do to give you, give you pause um, or, or, or for that matter, give you the heads up that like, yeah, I'm on the right track here. I'm, I'm, if I'm irritating the right people, maybe that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, I'm just going to, you know, unfortunately right now, no matter what I say, half the people are not going to like it. You know, I mean, the, the country is so divided. You know, there's no way that you can make everyone happy. So um, the be the best you can do is your best. Yeah, the the only the fear that I have is that I'm just always preaching to the choir. You know, that that kind of hurts. Um. Yeah, in my case, because I've done, uh, I mean, even before the two books that I've just talked about, I've done work on war. And I noticed that when you do work on war from the perspective that's not the familiar perspective, um, people often have a problem with it because they're not used to a story told from the perspective of a kamikaze pilot, for instance, or there's not so much understanding that, you know, not every kamikaze pilot actually wanted to, um, fight in the war or, you know, um, and, and with the German book too, the book about uh, my, uh, German, you know, my German experience, uh, I think my biggest concern was that um, I would, I would offend, um, I would offend people who suffered under, under the regime by talking about a German perspective, even though the perspective was one of, you know, shame and, and critical, critical confrontation. Um, and I, um, I mean, I can't say I was pleased, but I ha after my book came out, I, the opposite was actually true that um, the comments I got, uh, you know, a few comments I got that were critical were from those who felt that I was dragging Germany through the dirt, um, both from America and from Germany, feeling that, um, you know, the whole guilt thing should stop. We shouldn't, we shouldn't feel guilty anymore. We should leave the past behind. Um, and then there was something posted on a right, white supremacist website about my book. You know, why do Germans still feel like this if uh, the, the men, uh, AKA US soldiers who raped the, the German women are still walking around free. Um, and so, you know, I was glad that the criticism came from that end because uh, I think obviously for all of us, that's true that if you create work um, that, uh, you know, makes people think, um, you know, then that's not, I mean, that's probably a good thing. I mean, obviously it has to make them think in the right direction. So one thing that's actually really striking listening to the three of you talk, and I guess I, I didn't quite see this coming, and, uh, but each of you in a very specific way have spoken about history have spoken about the way the past is constructed and shaped and presented. And um, I wonder if, 
uh, invite you to, to talk a little more about that in the context of your particular projects. But I'm also curious to know, why do you think that's important now? Like, why is that, why is that happening? Because it doesn't seem uh, uh, coincidental. Why? I think because of the, the simple lack of historical exclusion, at least from my point of view. You know, it's, it's ironic, honestly, that I'm even sitting here at the Norman Rockwell Museum. And, uh, and the reason I say that is because, and I'll, I'll give you a little quick story, but um, some of us used to be invited to the Syracuse graduate program and Anita certainly was one. And you might've been there this day, Anita, I'm not sure. But I was sitting in the front row with Mary Tinkleman, who I dearly loved. And he was the head of the program. And he was showing uh, a film on the life of uh, Norman Rockwell. So I remember the commentator saying that Norman Rockwell represented American art. He was America's artist. And I sat there and Mary's sitting right next to me and I go, Mary, that's bullshit, <laughs> you know? And so Mary looks at me astounded, like, what, what did you say? I go, I, 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 no disrespect to Norman Rockwell and, and what he did represent um, and, and certainly his technical skills, but in my growing up, he meant nothing to me, nothing. You know, so Mary, who, who's the constant educator, says, Rudy, okay, after the film's over, I want you to address the audience, you know, so, which I did. And the first question I asked Mary was, and he's sitting in the front row with this little grin, you know, because he's put me on the spot now. And I look at Mary and I go, Mary, you, as a Jew growing up in Brooklyn, are you telling me you related to the art of Norman Rockwell? And he looks at me and he goes, no, no, I didn't. And I'm like, okay, case closed. Of course, I went and spoke a little bit more. Um, but what astounded me was afterwards, the people who came up to me and told me, thank you, thank you for saying that, you know? And so it's with this sense of responsibility that, that we proceed, you know? Well said. Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, and I will say, in, in Rockwell's defense, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the, having, having spent some time looking and thinking about this, so much of that was the editorial policy of the Saturday Evening Post. Absolutely. I agree. Because Norman Absolutely. Rockwell was selling magazines. And so, you know, the, the constraints on, on the representation of African-Americans in the Post was, were stringent. Right. Right. And which is part of why he ended up working for Look. But it's it's the question really isn't about any individual person's motivations. The question is about how does this how does the society structure its representations and who's in and who's out. Right. And, and that's the heart of your point. I totally agree. It, it, it's how he was used, you know, in, 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 a, in a manner of speaking. Anita, can you talk a little more about your uh, your women's history of art? I think that's well. I mean, you know that that's you know that sort of goes to history too. But I mean, it's interesting what you know what Rudy said. I mean, I I grew up in I'm Canadian. I grew up in Canada, and so I was always looking to Europe. I, I didn't have that much access to American art. So, so that's what I meant by that's not really my history. And I remember teaching at some American schools and I was like, oh, I never heard of this guy. You know, I felt really bad because I didn't hear, I, I had never heard of half of these artists. I shouldn't say that. Anyway, um, but, but yeah, no, I mean, I think that we have a responsibility to try and right wrongs that have been perpetuated throughout history. Certainly it's a way to learn. I mean, you know, I've been sort of criticized for comparing, uh, you know, Trump to, to Hitler. And that, that's a, it's a very shallow thing to, to, uh, to sort of to be angry about that. But if you look at how he came to power, that's what's interesting. And that's what, you know, I mean, I'm from German heritage too. I, I totally, I mean, I, I have chills when I read Nora's book because it's so relates to me, you know, um, I think it's such an important book, Nora, um, uh, both of them, and I can't wait to the, the next one. But, um, you know, we have a responsibility to, to, you know, 
to never have certain things happen again. We, we, we can't allow it. We can't allow it. Our civilization will collapse and civilizations have collapsed before. And I don't want to sound alarmist, but we also have climate change happening. And, you know, we need to start figuring this stuff out. And I think the best way to try and figure out, well, how, why are we here is how the hell did we get here? And how can we, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love Suko so much, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sad to hear that she's kind of given up. And I, I, I feel that way sometimes too, and I don't want to. But um, anyway, I think that's that's a long, long answer to the to the question of his of how history is important, and it is. Yeah, I think it's also the most natural. The most natural thing is uh, to understand that we are. I mean, we are who we are because of what was before. I think. There's so little consciousness about this, such short sightedness in both directions, you know, thinking of climate change too, in terms of the future, but also the past, you know, that our societies are built upon what was before. I mean, it's so evident. Genetically, we are who we are because of who was there before. We are the past and uh, we have to therefore continuously confront it. It doesn't have to be with shame, but it has to be with responsibility. And um, yeah, again, I think as, as artists, uh, that's our responsibility. But I think what we also need to understand, and, and Timothy Snyder writes about this too, is that um, history doesn't repeat itself. So uh, it's not like, you know, everything will happen again the way it happened before. Um, I agree with Anita that, you know, Trump, there are, ma there are many, many parallels to German history. But if we assume that history repeats itself, we make the wrong conclusions about new tyrants. And if we make wrong conclusions, we make wrong decisions in order to stop them in their tracks. So um, history doesn't repeat itself, but uh, we have to learn from it because we are made of it and we have a responsibility going forward. I think that's an incredible uh, thought to uh, end the conversation on. What an amazing panel. Oh, it's incredibly inspiring. I just want to invite um, one last question. And if any of our previous panelists would want to come on, uh, Robert or Chris, uh, Sue, and Ryan, if you want to pop on. Um, one question that's been coming up quite a bit is, um, you know, you've all done such exceptional work and what is feeling like it's next for you? Uh, what's that next thing that's going to be really satisfying? That's coming up quite a few times in the questions. Anybody want to talk about that? Do you, do you mean <coughs> projects? Do you mean book projects? Or, or it seems you... like, yes. I mean, Anita, you certainly talked about your project on um, important historical women, but um, I think people are anxious to know what else is coming. Well, well, for me, I could spend the rest of my life doing this because I've only done 180, you know, there are thousands. So, I mean, you know, this, uh, while we're in lockdown, certainly I'm going to keep doing this. So what, what about you, Nora and Rudy? Well, for me, it's, it's kind of a new direction. My collaborating with my wife, DK Dyson, she, we've, we've collaborated, you know, in terms of me doing album covers for her or backdrops at CBGBs and things like that. But now, um, we just were in the process of signing a deal to do a children's book together. So it's gonna be another whole outlet for us as a combined power, hopefully, um, to say the things we need to say. And that excites me big time. That is exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Else? No, Nora? I've already talked enough about my new book, I think. Uh, and I think what I'll do after that will be again, a continuation of uh, you know, thinking about history and how it informs us and, you know, serving basically uh, as a role, in the role as an of an illustrator in communicating those ideas. Great. Robert? Um, I've been vowing to do an adaptation of Moby Dick, which I think I'll finally do. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep putting it off <laughs> because the world is getting in the way and it's easier than facing it. So I'll probably face that next. I really want to see that. Thank Ryan? You. Well, um, I mean, this discussion of history 
interests me a lot in the sense of trying to find material that's lost, uh, voices that are lost, uh, work that uh, should be republished or even published for the first time that uh, where the author or artist is no longer alive. I mean, I feel a need to try to spotlight um, com important conversations that have been lost in that historical timeline. I mean, I've been for the longest time now publishing work that's on commission, new work and and shaping that uh, with the artists into, into publications. But uh, recently I've been delving into a lot of um, archives from estates and, and looking at work where I feel it's still relevant and it should be brought back out. So I'm always looking for suggestions. I'm always looking for uh, work that might've been lost. Um, and, and I would like to support that. That's great. That's a wonderful curatorial perspective too. And Douglas? You know, um, I'm, I'm working on a, a book of essays uh, on American illustration and cartooning, and but I, I, I'm also I, I'm I'm beginning to shape a, an illustrated memoir of growing up in the post-war United States and processing what has happened the last four years and the way that grew out of a set of falsely reassuring historical representations that we all swallowed, or not all of us, but um, some of us swallowed and, and have to be spat out. Great, thank you. You know, there's a comment in the chat uh, from Veronica, and she says, art and stories shape our collective understanding. And I think the work that you are all doing uh, in such extraordinary ways uh, is so helpful in that. So thank you for raising your voices through your work I think you're helping us to make sense of uh, oftentimes what seems like senseless circumstances. And um, our conversation today was so enlightening. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. And thank you to our audience. It was really wonderful to have you here. Uh, please do visit nrm.org for future events and conversations. And we hope you stay well and that we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all.